Welcome, my dear, dear friends. It's a blessing to see you. In case we haven't met before, I'm Stephen Clements, a writer, a gamer, and an enjoyer of big brain activities in general. On this channel, I perform dramatic story readings, I provide role-playing game and movie reviews, and I get to talk to interesting people. And on this episode, I'm going to be doing two of those things because we're not only going to be doing a review of Adventure Module O Night Divine, but we're also going to be speaking with its creator to find out what went into it, what inspired him in making this thing. Published by Guts and Glory, O Night Divine is a mid-level adventure compatible with both old and new schools of Dungeons and Dragons, but it is designed for the old school essential system. Let's see how it sells itself. A Christmas adventure compatible with your favorite D20 based RPGs. Intended for 3rd to 5th level characters, the Solstice Knight, a mighty warrior and avatar of the lawful god Kador, has crash landed in the city of Nighthaven, which has been enveloped by an eerie magical mist. With the champion of good laying wounded in the streets, it's up to you to restore the knight and to vanquish the evil now holding the city in its clutches. I'm not sure who made the design decision to put brown bronze text on green background, but it doesn't exactly pop off the page. Anyway, going to the credits page, we see this module is written by Ryan Howard. Who is Ryan Howard, you might ask? Well, he's the host of the Rollin' Bones podcast on YouTube, where I've enjoyed several of his interviews. He's also coming out with a new RPG game setting, Night Haven, and he is one of the two main hombres behind Guts and Glory Games, partnering with our dear, dear friend Keelan Halverson. Keelan also gets the art credit, and there is plenty of it in the module. From this rich module cover, through every piece inside, his distinctive style comes through, and I like it. The full-page art pieces are impressive, and the smaller panels range from something as simple as an ice school to this gonzo, terrifying Franken-dragon. Ian McGarrity holds a cartography credit, but it's, um, rough stuff. I'll save the problems until we get into the review, but believe me, I will count the ways. Now, before we get into O Night Divine, I'm going to go ahead and let the lily-livered ones amongst you who clicked on this video not expecting spoilers and a walkthrough of the module to get on out of here and to send this to somebody who will be brave enough to go through it all. But come on, it says RPG Review in the title. The introductory flavor text is way better than any opening fiction White Wolf ever wrote. So that's good. Astrological events, such as equinoxes and solstices, are significant not just for their effect on the weather, but for their magical properties. The barriers between the material plane and those that border it become fragile, especially on the night of the winter solstice. As nature's cycle of withering and death passes over Darehome, the spirits of the dead grow restless and seek to break free of their liminal torment. In response, the army of Kador, lord of justice and battle, elected a champion to stand in the breach and defend the innocent from the vengeful dead. This champion is known as the Solstice Knight, upon whom is bestowed the Winter Fang, the Justiciar's mantle, and one of Kador's coveted sigils of absolution. For many, Winter Solstice is a festive time filled with feasting and celebration. For this warmth and merriment, they have the Solstice Knight to thank. There's a well-organized table of contents showing the module of 17 pages of adventure with 12 pages of appendices. Strangely, if you click on the sections listed in the table of contents, it doesn't jump you to the section like some PDFs do. It opens this Google Doc that you can request edit access for. I've never seen that in a module before, and I'm not sure why I'm seeing it now. We start those module pages with environmental details that help set the mood and for the DM to immerse the players in the cold, still, and ominous night. That's followed by the setup for the Santa figure being a badass paladin, pushing back the things that go bump in the night as the solstice night. And yes, I am going to keep referring to him as Santa throughout this adventure because that's who it's supposed to be. I was pleasantly surprised at the historical details of Old Saint Nick that made their way into the NPC and how successfully he translated into a heroic champion of good in a game. Howard also describes the interesting and unique magic items the Solstice Knight has that empower him to be as powerful a servant of his god that he is. Or was. I say was because the adventure opens with his flying sleigh being blown apart in a terrorist attack. That's right, Santa gets hit with a terrorist attack. A planted explosive in his sleigh goes off as he makes his rounds on the longest night of the year, in full view of the city below and the party. So if someone placed a bomb on the flying sleigh, who did it? In The Lord of Ice Returns, we find out that Lord Fragunda, a powerful adventurer in his own right, has joined the dragon-worshipping cult, the Dragon Hearts. 
Joined by a racist gnome, Sinbar Clockright, and a magic user, Magus Gilroy, the three plot to summon back to the world, Grath the White Dragon Lord. Fragunda has gathered a large social party in his manor to be food for the summoned Dragon Lord. Magus Gilroy has set magical fog onto the city to lock it down, and Sinbar is the one who made and planted the bomb. Their plan is to sacrifice the holy and pure of Solstice Night to complete their ritual summoning. Because bringing an evil of such magnitude into the world requires a sacrifice worthy of it. One problem, though. If the bombing is a 30% chance of outright killing Santa, how will they be able to sacrifice him? If he does survive the blast, within six hours he will bleed out, which is bad, but he will be found by the bad guys out to capture him at most by then, but likely much earlier. Now here we have a logic problem. There's a good chance the only worthy sacrifice to summon their demon god will be killed by the plot to catch him. That's not a smart move. Now that I think about it, this art doesn't make sense in light of the text. Racist gnome Sinbar is said to have planted the bomb in the sleigh, but this art shows a chimney exploding, the solstice night falling, and the sleigh is beep bopping on by. Why the inconsistency? Where the fat man lands can be handled two ways. One, he lands where your players happen to be. Or two, the DM rolls some dice to find where on the map he landed. Either way, each of his three unique magic items get their own rolls to determine where they went on the map. While this may help with replay value by randomizing the objective locations, I wonder if this gets tedious because of the amount of grinding the search is going to take. And we'll get to that in a minute. Remember, the bad guys have agents looking for Santa and his magic items, so they may get there first. Now, this adventure also assumes the party rushes to investigate, and if Santa isn't outright killed in the attack, there is a ticking clock for how long the party has to find and rescue him. But this also requires a party to be good-hearted enough or curious enough to want to go help. Some players may see a terrorist attack and run, or simply not care. If you're asking, what kind of players would leave Santa to die in the streets after a terrorist attack? You haven't DM'd for enough players. Some players only care for things that directly benefit their characters, so they're going to be wanting to get paid up front. Now that we have the clock started, Howard writes that hex exploration is key to the adventure, and I do like hex crawls. The magical fog makes it likely the party will get lost and move in directions they didn't intend requiring wisdom checks from the party's navigator with each new hex. And parties having navigators is a mechanic I talked about in Suitable Donation, so I'm 100% behind this. Each hex will take 20 minutes to clear, both for searching it for the Solstice Knight and his equipment, and for the random encounter that will happen in it. There's no role on whether a random encounter will happen or not, only a role to see what is encountered. This is a good time to point out how... Uh, unnecessarily large the tables are compared to any others I've seen for the level of detail provided. For example, the encounter table takes up a page and a half for just 12 briefly detailed encounters. This table references a random monsters table, but that's on page 20, 11 pages away from the encounter table that uses it. And this entire page is eaten up by very basic lists. Why not have the tables next to each other? So the DM doesn't have to jump 11 pages when the dice say to, and remember, they have to be rolling on this every hex the party goes through. Speaking of which, the table doesn't tell us why two entries are bolded, but the rest aren't. Now my guess is this is a reference to these entries being lightly detailed on page 22, but the table doesn't tell us that's the case. Speaking of hexes, we aren't given a starting location for the party, but for every three hexes they travel, Everybody has to make constitution checks or start racking up attack and damage penalties from the biting cold. In interested parties, Howard fleshes out which factions are on the ground looking for Santa. And shockingly, there are actually good guys out there who can help. From this randomized hex crawl setup, we're then told that in hex F6, there's a simple barge moored to the docks. Why do we care about the barge? Because the barge has two ritual circles on it. One, which has a cold flame burning inside it, that is the source of the magical fog cloaking the city. If you put out the cold flame, the fog will eventually dissipate, ruining Magus Gilroy's grip on the city. The second holds a teleportation circle in it, pre-positioned by the bad guys to allow their agents to get back to Fergunda's manor swiftly once they catch old Saint Nick. Uh, the only problem with that plan is Hex F6 only borders three hexes, one of which is mostly hillside, leaving about 16 hexes either inaccessible to the barge or more conveniently located to just drag the fat guy up the lone road going to the manor. I don't know that the Solstice Knight is actually fat. He's probably in really good shape. But just roll with me on this. 
If Santa lands on the south side of the river, the barge does the bad guys no good because there's no mention of a pilot being on board to cross over to get them. Nor is there a method for the bad guys to communicate for moving the barge if there was a pilot. This seems like a really bad idea because it would make way more sense for the barge to be centrally located to maximize access and to be there to help Santa nappers on the southern shore. Oh, now that I say southern shore, I could be completely wrong in that. The map doesn't have a compass on it. It also doesn't specify how big the hexes are. I can guess north is towards the top of the page and south is closer to the bottom, but that's me filling in a gap a competent cartographer shouldn't have left open. That's not the only problem we have here. Why would you get on the barge in the first place? There's nothing in the adventure that points to that being a place you should go. It's at the far end of the map, so players will be better off exploring more accessible areas. As you may be guessing, this module does have problems and we're not even halfway through the page count. I read modules at bedtime because they're effectively instruction manuals, and instruction manuals are not the most exciting things in the world to read, so they help me go to sleep. This module is written more like a railroad story, and I like the story, but there are sections missing from the tracks. Yes, I could fill in the gaps myself, but I could also write an adventure myself and not pay someone else for the privilege of me getting to do more work. And this is why everyone needs an editor. And by editor, I don't mean your friend that takes one skim read through it and says, cool story, bro. I mean someone who knows how the English language works and what professional product looks like. Someone who knows what write looks like. Someone who knows how to look for inconsistencies, gaps in the story, and in the mechanics. To troubleshoot all the things I've mentioned so far and more. The typographical errors in this thing are killing me. And here's a list of errors I found before I gave up noting them. Now, I'm not an old school essentials aficionado, so maybe this stat block makes sense to people who are, but it looks weird to me. In a criticism of the OSC format itself, why use these brackets instead of colons? The more text characters in a space, the more clutter you have, which isn't what most people are looking for. It doesn't help things be readable. Most people prefer clean presentations because they're easier to read and more appealing. Anyway, back to the module. Did I mention there's a trap chest on the boat that can lock the player characters in with it and obliterate them and the boat in 1d6 rounds? Because there is one. We aren't given a number of damaged dice to roll, just that the PCs will be blown up with the barge. And as someone who's been on an action movie kick, blowing up boats near a waterfront, not bad. I like it. Whether by teleportation circle, by sleigh they can somehow still fly despite being bombed, or by foot, the next and final location is Lord Fragunda's Manor. What, what's that you say? Well, I get three locations across 33 pages? Yes, three. And that's only if you count the town, which doesn't get any real detail given to it. One blank town, one out of the way barge, and one manor. That's it. Besides the overly large tables, there's also a lot of blank space on the page where other designers have fit in more text and substance in the same page count or less. In a module I'm reading right now, 32 pages gets you four adventures, a wilderness area, a dungeon, a palace, and a city with shops and locations that ooze character. In Joseph Block's Music Land, we get an entire demiplane and how it works, 10 locations, several of which have sublocations new spells, magic items, and more in 28 pages, counting the covers. Uh, okay, okay, all right, all right, back to the module. So we're at the manor, and here's the map. Does anything weird jump out to you about the manor being depicted on this map? If you only named one problem, you missed at least two more. We get no scale to tell us how big each square is, so I just had to make one up. It has one door. A manor that is 110 feet by 65 feet only has one door leading in and out. The servants bring in firewood, water, food, and everything else have to go through the one front door 80 feet away from where they're going to be taking the stuff for storage or to cook. That means all their refuse has to go across all the nice areas of the manor to go out the same front door. That's not how manors are set up. They're servants' entrances for reasons. At least give me a garbage chute. We also don't get a map for the second story in the tower, despite some really important things happening there. If the party comes in through the front door instead of teleporting into the second story, they are faced by the major domo of the manor, who's accompanied by two uniformed soldiers, who are in fact automatons called Ten Soldiers. I have no idea why they're here or who made them, but they're neat and fit the Christmas theme. Fragunda's office is pretty swank, what with a stuffed displacer beast, an orc head, and an enemy's partially burned banner. 
He also has a hidden treasure vault, which is pretty stacked with gold, gems, magic weapons, and bullets for new magic item, the Dragonfeller Revolver, which is listed in the appendix. If you want a revolver to put the rounds in, the armory has some guarded by 10 soldiers. While it is possible to bypass the big social event going on in the Grand Hall and parlor and, and storm straight into the ritual room on the second floor, I found the party itself interesting and loaded with dramatic potential. The Grand Hall is a massive ballroom adorned in deep blue and silver. The center of the room is dedicated to dancers with a grand musical ensemble playing lively seasonal tunes. The outer edges are filled with buffet tables and circular dining tables. However, the hall is currently the site of an outright bacchanal. I love that word, bacchanal. Music and dancing have given way to an almost unmanageable wave of human debauchery. There is something eerie and unsettling about the behavior of these seemingly respectable people. Should any party members attempt to eat or drink? Ew. Should any party members attempt to eat or drink, we'll need to... Oh, 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 good. I didn't even notice this in the previously while reviewing it. Should any party members attempt to eat or drink, we'll need to make a save against mind control or join in the party. Uh, you see what I'm talking about. An editor is very useful. So, should any party members attempt to eat or drink, they will need to make a save against mind control or join in the party. And there's 1d10, 10 soldiers in the Grand Hall, and they will subdue anyone trying to leave and attack anyone who resists. Oh my. And in the next room, the parlor. That is a plushly adorned parlor immediately off the Grand Hall. Now, this one has sober guests in it who seem to be sheltering from the debauchery going on outside. And there are two notable guests from the city of Nighthaven in here. Castor Jordan, Baron of Nighthaven, and Mandrake Hawk, a criminal mastermind and the leader of a gang called Hawk's Talons. These guys are confused as to, one, why Lord Fergunda has not made an appearance, and two, the, the orgy going on in the next room. Hawk has some idea of what's going on, but he's not going to help. Riordan can be convinced to help and will take charge of the scene if informed of the nature of the party. So that's neat. We have two notable NPCs that have their own agendas, and they are as much at risk of what's going on here as the party and everybody, all the other NPCs are. On the second story, we get two keyed locations, but no map to match them to. So how big these rooms are and how you get between them is powered by your imagination. Location A is the teleportation circle connected to the barge and guarded by 10 soldiers. Location B is the boss fight of the module and it is the ritual chamber where Lord Fergunda, the racist gnome, and Magus Gilroy are gathered around an altar. I love this flavor text. The bulk of the tower is taken up by a large, complete dragon skeleton encased in ice carved to resemble an incredibly lifelike dragon statue. The statue is also covered in tubes which lead down to an altar in the middle of the room. The altar sits atop a demonic ritual symbol carved into the floor and is covered in grooves which feed directly into the symbol on the floor. Is this a bloodletting altar? Yes, it is, my dear, dear friends. Why do I get so excited about bloodletting altars? Uh, I mean, I've seen them in real life, but anyway. There is also a strange machine in the room that is connected to the tubes coming from the dragon. And of course, the conspirators have 10 soldiers there to help keep order. And then there's some cool magic stuff in there. In this, look at this. That's messed up. Next in the text, we're told that the plan to sacrifice Santa to seal the deal isn't strictly necessary. And in fact, basically any sacrifice will do. It's kind of a letdown. It can be the solstice night, the party, or even a betrayed Lord Fragunda. Here I was thinking Santa being sacrificed was a critical part of the plot, but apparently not. So at least that's one logic problem cleared up. Whoever it is, the gnome supremacist and magic user get on with the ritual, and the demonic energies being invoked cause a blizzard filled with lightning strikes to form outside. If allowed to continue, one of those lightning strikes will somehow hit the Franken Dragon and animate it. I don't know if that comes through an opening in the roof, blows through the roof, or what, because we don't have a map or any of those details. Howard says that to prevent the ritual, the party has to either destroy the Franken Dragon or keep the sacrificial blood from reaching it. I would think killing the ritualists before the sacrifice of anybody would work, but apparently not. If the party succeeds in interrupting the ritual, the magical energy built up so far finds no other place to go than to explode in the ritual room, causing 5d6 damage and freezing targets in ice on a failed save versus dragon breath. I'm not sure if that's 
all or nothing, or if you succeed, you take half the damage and get a little stiff. It just, that's what the text says. You pass it or you fail it, you eat it or you don't. It also doesn't say what the ramifications of getting frozen in ice will do. Is that an instant kill? Are you temporarily immobilized? I would think that's pretty lethal to anything that breathes. If the ritual succeeds, Grath, the demon dragon, occupies the Franken dragon prepared for him, eats the party, eats the party guests, and then eats the assholes who summoned him. Because the demon is never on your side, kids. Don't ever play with them, and don't ever make deals with them. Thus ends the adventure, and we get the appendices. We start with a random monster and reaction roll tables. Table A3 isn't actually a table for some reason. It's actually the stat blocks for the bad guys and the special NPCs in the module, except for Santa. Now that I'm looking, we don't get the Solstice Knight's stats anywhere. That seems like an oversight, especially since the module envisions him, if he survives, fighting alongside the party. Appendix B covers the magic items introduced in the adventure, including firearms, which is split between two non-consecutive sections for some reason, the Solstice Knight's magic items, which are frankly awesome, one immunity to cold and to have undead that strike you explode? You want the Justiciar's mantle. One of Charisma 17 and a level of Paladin. The Seal of Absolution is your boy, but only if you're willing to be the new Solstice Knight. His sword, Winter's Fang, does double damage to undead, demons, and dragons and utterly and permanently destroys them if a hit drops them to zero. None of these strike me as overpowered because they come with a cost, and they do have limitations. Appendix C talks about the setting, the city of Nighthaven, and how it will be fully detailed in the future. So the question I posed early on, what are we getting in a 37-page module with only 17 pages of module? Here, Howard explains the setup. Like the future Nighthaven expansions, this module is designed to detail part of the city, describe one of the factions operating in it, in this case the Dragonheart Cult, and provide a module to let you play with it. I wish the writing had been more clear on that design philosophy applying to this module because it says each issue of Guts and Glory will be like that, but not that this module also did that. I would also have preferred for the setup of the module to be explained at the beginning and not at the end to help frame everything in my mind. He also provides lore behind the demon dragons and their cult. I sop this part up like a biscuit in butter. We learn more about the Solstice Knight's god Kador, more backstory on the knight, and why the racist gnome is racist. Howard also discusses how this adventure can fit into your home game, the consequences of the ending your party gets, and the possibility that one of your players could become the new Santa Claus. He then finishes by plugging Keelan Halverson's upcoming adventure and where to get more information on their future projects. Since newer modules by independent creators don't often have the historical background details out there available that I like to give you in these reviews, I asked Ryan Howard if he would be kind enough to do an interview to give those to us. He was gracious enough to agree, so let's see what he has to say. And my dear, dear friends, we have the author of the module with us today to help shed some light on the inspirations behind it and to help explain the details that we saw there. So, my dear, dear friends, welcome Ryan Howard to the show. Ryan, hey, Stephen, thanks for having me on. Great having you, and I enjoy your show, Rolling Bones. Y'all have some good conversations there. Thank you. All right, so, O Night Divine, a Christmas module. Mm -hmm. The Santa character gets hit with a terrorist attack. What inspired you to make this module? So, I love Christmas. I have always loved Christmas deep in my heart. It's something that I value and cherish very much. And part of that is loving Christmas movies. Some of the Christmas movies that I've enjoyed include themes about Santa Claus running into trouble on his nightly run. The Santa Claus is probably the most famous example from my generation's canon of Christmas movies. But there's this one movie that came out five years ago called The Christmas Chronicles where Kurt Russell plays Santa Claus. He's downed in Chicago, I believe, and has to get the help from two children to find his stuff again. And they get up to all this hijinks, and the movie is really good. But while I was watching it, I was thinking, what if this was a D&D &D adventure? What if, instead of enlisting the help of two children, Santa Claus had to enlist the help of your average D&D &D party? And then, to take it a step further, what if Santa died, and then someone in the D&D &D party had to then take on that mantle to complete his mission? That's a very interesting approach to take. I, because, you know, I saw a, a Christmas theme adventure. I thought, oh, okay, well, what's this about? And then I saw how grimdark it was. And now I see the angle that you had in going after that. <laughs> I like it. I like the concept. 
That's cool, man. In writing the Santa character, I noticed that you probably did some research into this because I saw the place named Demray in there, which a lot of people probably don't even know where that is. It's this area in southwestern Turkey near the Turkish Riviera. And I've been there. I've been to Demray. I've been to Myra where St. Nicholas, mm -hmm. the real world St. Nicholas is from. So what research did you do and what shaped the Santa character that you gave us? Yeah, so there was a lot of reading on the real St. Nicholas, and thank you for picking up on that. That's a an Easter egg I put in there for folks who are extremely religious. My Catholic and Orthodox brothers out there probably appreciated that too, but also just anyone who is learned on St. Nicholas, I, I put that Easter egg in there for them. But with the real St. Nicholas, you have someone who had such conviction in his belief that he got into a fist fight with another bishop at one of the Christian councils. And so I was just thinking, you know, what if a guy that was kind of this well hard, this dedicated to his beliefs, a paladin, a real world paladin for all intents and purposes, was the actual Santa Claus? And what if Santa Claus, because we're in a DD and d type setting, was a paladin? Because that just made sense to me, considering everything that I had learned and read about St. Nicholas and then everything that was kind of coming together around what this role of Santa Claus or the Solstice Knight, as he is seen in O Night Divine, would actually entail for the bearer of that mantle. Yeah, I love the story, the background, the buildup you give for the character. And of course, as you mentioned, the option that one of the player characters might wind up inheriting this mantle if things go poorly for the Solstice Knight. And you said something that's triggered a, another thought, another axe I have to grind about more modern uses of the paladin character class in that after third edition Dungeons and Dragons, anybody could be a paladin and there was virtually no consequences if you violated your oath. Your oath was just kind of window dressing to what you were doing. And I'd love to hear your thoughts is that there is, in my perception and in literary traditions and legends and myths, a certain power that comes with a purity of spirit, no other alignment can replicate. And so if you meet someone who is saintly, there is a presence about them. There is a force about them that you're just not going to get off someone else and say you're evil. Well, go be a warlock, go be a wizard, go be a priest of some dark deity. But I think reserving the paladin status to a lawful good character that epitomizes that kind of purity is the right thing to do. So I'm in agreement with the old editions. What do you think? Oh, I'm definitely right there with you. In fact, if you read into the Sigil of Absolution, which is the thing that gives the Solstice Knight his power, in the item description, I put that it will forcibly change your alignment to lawful good. And if you basically have two choices, you either accept the mantle or you will die. Kador, the god of justice who basically the Solstice Knight is his avatar, he says, you know, if you put this thing on, you are either duty-bound to be my servant or you will be killed immediately. And that's the ethos that I was approaching the paladin with in this, is that once you take on this power, you then have to also take on the duty and responsibility of being the best person you can possibly be, following the law in spirit and in letter. And basically you have to be the one in a million who truly is that pure of heart. I love it. I'm glad that you put that in there. And since we're talking about the inspiration behind the adventures, it's completely relevant to what we're talking about. In reading the background of the Santa character, he is a badass. He, he is. took out what, a couple hundred whites by yeah. himself. Mm -hmm. And that's really tough to do in any edition of D&D I've seen, but you used old school essentials for this. Is that correct? Yes. All of the modules that we put out through Guts and Glory, what we say is it is playable with your favorite D20 system. I used OSE as kind of my Rosetta Stone for BX because myself and my artist partner and publishing partner Wonky, we believe that there is a universal gaming language and that universal gaming language is best understood through the lens of basic expert Dungeons and Dragons. So that's kind of where the OSE foundation comes in is OSE is a very readable, very accessible iteration of the BX rules that a lot of people own. And so that was kind of my frame of reference for how I'm going to make all of these stats as clear as I possibly can to any reader, and then they can further adapt it to whichever iteration of the game they want to use. So the level given for the Solstice Knight for a person from a D&D background doesn't look particularly high. In old school essentials, 
is that level far more robust than a comparable D and D character would be? The reason he was able to take on 200 whites is that Kador intervened on his behalf because he was performing a truly selfless act to protect others. And so, yes, in strict game terms, one player character probably could not take on 200 whites. But I felt like I was able to use a little bit of creative license, a little bit of uh, embellishment because of the circumstances of setting up who this character is and how he was able to gain the abilities that he has now. That'd be a terrifying fight to be in because whites, they're, ooh, <laughs> it's tough stuff. You know, yeah, and uh, if, if he rolled really well on his turn check, <laughs> then he probably could have <laughs> gotten a whole bunch of them to run away right off the bat, so... <laughs> So the legend might have fudged how many he destroyed versus how many he turned away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, either way, they're not there anymore. He held the field. That's a win. The background of the Solstice Knight, that was interesting, but also kind of the villain that can get unleashed at the end of this adventure, this demon dragon, this dude, ooze story, and he was friggin' terrifying. And I think you wrote him appropriately because if the bad guys do succeed at their plan, everyone's screwed. Not just the people they want screwed, everyone is screwed, which is entirely in keeping with an evil of the scale you're talking about. Tell me more about this demon dragon cult stuff you got going on. Yeah, so dragons are very central to the world of Nighthaven, and they're very central to all of my plans moving forward, especially with this forthcoming Guts and Glory Volume 1. But my idea with dragons is they're in the name of the most famous fantasy role-playing game. A lot of people use them in a very generic manner. I wanted to make dragons a truly terrifying force, and the way that I thought to do that is that dragons are the physical avatars of demons. So each dragon represents a different form of death or destruction. They're, they're almost like the horsemen of the apocalypse of my world. In this one, Grath the White, white dragons are typically weaker than other dragons and usually more animalistic. So he's wanton destruction personified. And then, you know, you've got red dragons, which would represent the demonic fire. There's a plague dragon. There's a dragon of death. This is all stuff that I've come up with. That's what I was getting at is dragons are avatars of demons. And so when you have people who are worshiping these dragons or trying to bring them back from their exile, their banishment, or their slaying, what you have is demon worshipers trying to essentially bring about the end times. <laughs> Yeah, it does feel very cataclysmic, the consequences of what could arise should the party not succeed in containing this threat by the end of the module. So kudos to you. I like that. And the lore you put in the back about this very topic, now the elves figured into it. This was something different. I liked it. It was refreshing to see what you did there. Another thing that I look at in every module review I do is the art, the presence of it, the lack of it, the quality of it, all that stuff. And now I might be biased because I'm a fan of Keelan's work and he figures prominently through the thing. So tell me about the art. Did you provide the seeds for what Keelan was going to do? Did Keelan hear a couple words from you and say, I got this? Or did he draw some stuff and then you ran with that? Who fed who in this creative process? So the way that Wonky and I work, we, we very much function as a partnership. Like I said, we are partners in guts and glory. But the way that we work is I will give him descriptions of pieces that I think would be cool, scenes that I want to depict. I describe them in as much detail as I possibly can, and then really give him room to embellish or make changes or play with the perspective of the piece and, and really kind of imprint his artistic ideas onto my descriptions. Because... I am an incomplete creator in that I cannot create visually what I visualize in my head. So when I turn that stuff over to Wonky, part of it is asking him to pull the image I have in my head out of my head, but he does so with such panache and flair, and he brings this real creeping darkness to all of his art. It really is a true partnership. The way that he interprets my vision creates kind of the unified aesthetic of Guts and Glory. That's how we work together is I give him the idea, he creates the piece, and a lot of times he has created something or pulled something out of my description that I didn't know was there, but 
really needed to be there the whole time. That's great. Well, those are the questions I've got for you. Are there any other details that you'd like the audience to know about before we close out this interview? The making of this module was truly a Christmas miracle in and of itself. Everything that could go wrong with it did go wrong. We had delays in the art. We had initially this was going to be a double release with another adventure, which is now being released as part of Guts and Glory Volume 1. Basically, this was Keelan and I pulling all-nighters. We had our layout guy on deck and then his computer crapped out. And so I had to teach myself how to do layout in Canva in four days. So everything that you see in this book layout-wise, that's all me in Canva. So so keep that in mind. Ended up being a great experience and it made me want to pursue doing layout. So on Guts and Glory Volume 1, I'm going to be doing layout this time in a real layout tool. So folks at home, if when you're trying to pursue your dreams and everything goes to hell, keep pushing because you still got to get where you're trying to go or else you'll be filled with regret that you gave up and you stopped where you were. So thanks, Ryan. I appreciate the details and cool adventure, man. Thank you. Oh Night Divine is available as a PDF on DriveThruRPG. And my dear, dear friends, you don't know how good it feels to tell you an adventure is on DriveThruRPG without having to talk about Hasbro's published enunciation of the people who wrote it. I don't have to say, don't give your money to people who hate you, because this time I can happily say, give your money to Ryan. He probably likes you, and I like him. At this point, you may be asking, but Steven, my dear, dear friend, you just spent most of this review savaging Ryan's module. Why would you tell me to give him money? Aha, my beloved viewer, you may have left out the good things I said about the module. People often only hear or focus on the negative parts, and you can tell them all kinds of nice things on the side, and they'll just ignore the crap out of them and only fixate on this. But a good reviewer has to properly account for both, honestly and with transparency. The story, the setting, the characters are all very good, which is why I took the time to read the excerpts to you that hooked me in the hopes that they'll hook you as well. But if you bought this adventure and then started catching flaws in it, and they were flaws that I didn't point out in my review, then you would be justified in questioning my ability and my integrity as a reviewer. And so for all my dear, dear friends out there that are into creating, please entertain some of my advice to new writers, whether they're writing novels, short stories, or designing adventure modules. On DriveThruRPG, it says this was published January 4, 2024. This is a Christmas module, but it's a Christmas module released after Christmas. I get the feeling this was a rush job, in that it was intended to be released before Christmas, some things went wrong, and Howard got it out as soon as he could. Well, having been in the seat of a new writer, with a novella burning a hole in my pocket, my best advice is to not rush it. Take the time to tell your story the way it deserves to be told as a fully developed story. And I mentioned get an editor, because that story needs to be fully baked, not half-baked. It's very easy to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on a professional editor, and that may not be feasible, and it might not even make sense for what you're doing. But find someone you know that has a solid grasp of English, and if you don't know who they are, they're the people who text and complete sentences with proper punctuation, and ask them for help. I've done editing work for friends pro bono because I want them to succeed, and I've been paid because some of those friends insisted on it. I've also had the pleasure of working with professional editors like Lorraine Cantwell, and I learned so much from her guidance that I get to share with my friends. She is such a darling to work with, I need to invent a reason to do so again. Anybody that writes has the task of accurately writing down the thing they're trying to get out of their head, and in a way that makes sense to people who aren't them. Sometimes, a writer thinks what they wrote has all the details, but it often doesn't. The writer simply reads their own thoughts onto the page where he forgot to actually write them. That's why I ask people to proofread my stuff. Yes, I have several publications under my belt, but even pros make mistakes and need editors to catch them. Not only should people get an editor, they should read the greats and climb onto their shoulders. In AD&D First Edition alone, there's so many top shelf modules that you don't have to look far. The classic modules are classic for reasons, one of which is because they hold up to modern readings. They're well written and can be ran easily. Study the greats to see what right looks like. Bad takes many forms, but great novels, great movies, great adventure modules, each of these things have technical points in common when done right. Read Gygax and Block to see how much detail can be conveyed with so few words. When you want to have some fun with the text, read Hammock and Clark to learn how. The giants who came before us have so much to offer and such broad shoulders to stand on. So do the work to climb up there 
get on their shoulders and do the work to take it to all new heights. And as a final bit of advice, don't you ever fucking use Google Docs. I don't give a shit who you are. Do not use Google Docs. It is not a real word processor. Use Microsoft Word. Use LibreOffice. There are plenty of quality, free, open source word processors in the world. If you come to me with a Google Doc, I am going to tell you to go pound sand. I'm not fucking with it anymore. Why do I say that? Well, let me see. Google Docs is garbage in formatting. It doesn't hold on to anything. It's very limited in what it'll let you do, or at least what I've seen it capable of doing. If you intend to be a real writer, get the right tool for the job. Just like a painter shouldn't go with some brush that's already missing half the fibers, it's already caked with a bunch of other people's stuff, and there's very little they can do with it, they're gonna produce garbage art which these days is probably gonna sell for millions because of rich people hiding money. But if you intend to put out a quality product, get a real word processor. And that's my advice. If you enjoyed this review, I too enjoy when people like and subscribe. So just hit the little buttons, it's free and it won't hurt nothing. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So please drop them in the chat. I read them all and I respond to them all. And as we do, dear friends, part for now. I wish you nothing but the best. <laughs>